morning, church. It's good to see you this morning. We're so glad that you're here. I hope and trust that you've had a good week, and it's good to be in the house of the Lord together. We're thankful for your presence, and as the scripture says, it's always good to be in the house of the Lord, and we'll give the Lord praise for that opportunity. We welcome you to our time of worship. Let me share with you a couple of announcements to draw your attention to. We have a deacon seminar. You see an announcement in your bulletin about that that will be beginning today from 4 to 6. And if you're interested in that, we encourage you to come and be part of this training. We think it will be very beneficial, and we're very thankful for those who are putting this on for us. Also, pickleball is starting back up. That will be on Tuesdays and uh, Thursday nights. You see information in your bulletins about that. We have an Easter egg hunt that's right around the corner, and we are taking up a love offering to help Samaritan's Purse for earthquake victims, and our ushers will be in the back to receive that at the end of the service. So please be mindful of all of these announcements. Are there any other announcements that need to be made this morning? All right. Several of us go to Taco Bell, so we have a Taco Bell club on Wednesday night after services, and they have, the people that go have been talking about wanting to get the seniors back together again like it used to. So I'm going to attempt to try. Our first uh, outing will be um, Tuesday. I know it's short notice. But the movie, um, Jesus Revolution, I hear it's really, really good. And so we're going to try to get a van load up um, on Tuesday. We'll, you should be here if you want to go. Be here at 2.15. We will be leaving at 2.30 um, to go see the movie. So that would be it. All right. Thank you, Linda. We certainly appreciate that. $5. $5. <laughs> $50 for popcorn. $50 for popcorn. $50 for popcorn. I had to sneak my own in. That. Amen. I appreciate that, Chris. Yeah, amen. Praise the Lord for that. If nothing further, we'll begin our worship at this time.
We got kids come from everywhere. <laughs> and we love our kids, and we're so thankful for you, and we're so glad that you're in church, and we hope that you'll be in the church your whole life. Even when you get older and you have families of your own and you're, you're married and you have your own children, you'll be in church because you love the Lord and that's so important. This morning I want to talk to you about kindness. And, you know, the Bible tells us to be kind to one another. And there are ways that we can show one another kindness. And I wonder if some of you can tell me a way that you can be kind to somebody. All right, Kinsley, what you think? If someone got hurt, you could help them. All right. If someone's trying to do something, you want to help them. All right, Madison. Helping them by cleaning your room. That's a good thing to do. All right. If they're hurt, you can help them up, all right? By help them by helping them. That's a, good, all right? What you got? Clean up their blocks. That's a good thing to do, all right? Yeah, you can pray for them. That's right, that's right. All right, down here on the end, what we got? Kind words, that's right. All right, what we got down there? Bring canned goods for people that can't afford it. You can help them with food. All right, what you got? This is the last one. Help give them food. Help, help clean up their food. Uh, right, I know. That's enough. All right, everybody's had a chance. Um, yes, we can show kindness by the things that we do, like helping people when they're hurt. But we can also show kindness by the things that we say. And we have to be careful about the things that we say. I was around some children the other day, and it wasn't here at church. But one little child looked at the other and said, you look fat. And you know, I don't think they meant it in a bad way. But for some people, when they hear those words, maybe it doesn't matter that much to them. But other people, it makes them feel really, really bad. And maybe it's something that they really have to deal with and they feel bad about their selves and they feel like nobody loves them because someone said that to them. And so this morning, I really want you to think about kindness. And I not only want you to think about the things that you do for other people because that's so important, but be very careful about the things that you say toward other people because it can be really hurtful. If you're in class and somebody tries to answer a question and they say the wrong, they give the wrong answer and you say you're not smart, that can really hurt them. So be careful about your words and be kind in your words. Danny Ray. I like what Danny Ray said. If you, you can think about it in your head before you say it. And if it's not kind, don't say it at all. That's good. All right, I've given everybody a chance to say something this morning, and I believe that Madison's going to pray for us this morning. Jesus, thank you for everybody that's here, and thank you for God, and he died on the cross for us. Amen.
love our kids, but sometimes it's like trying to herd cats, isn't it? Put them all together. Let's take a look at our prayer list. There are several that we're praying for. I think Denise went to the uh, doctor this morning. Please be praying for Denise Barber, not feeling well today. Also, William Scott came through his gallbladder surgery, but he's at home. He wanted to be with us today, but he's at home not feeling well, so please uh, continue to pray for William, having a lot of pain and discomfort. Ashley Causey's still much in need of our prayers, so let's remember all these needs. Are there other special needs this morning before we go to the Lord in prayer today? Anyone with a special need? Rayford Wooten colon cancer. Let's remember that need. Walter Brown passed away. We've been praying for that need as well. How about unspoken requests by uplifted hands today? All right, let's remember that need. Let's pray together. Lord, we are so thankful to be in your house today and have an opportunity to worship you. And we know, Lord, that you are here in our midst. And we know, Lord, that you are working in mighty ways. And we thank you, Lord, for all these little children. And, Lord, we just pray that you'll put a hedge of protection around them and around their families. And we ask, God, that you'll keep them safe. 
Lord, we hear every day about situations where young people are discouraged or young people are in jeopardy. And God, we just pray for those children, the ones in our church and the one outside our church. And we just ask God that you'll bless them and help them. God, today we lift up to you those that are sick. And we ask God that you'll touch them and heal them as it would be your perfect will. Lord, we also pray for those that are, have lost loved ones recently. And we ask God that you'll give them grace and strength. It seems like every week we hear of someone else that's lost a loved one connected with our church. And, and God, we just pray for those needs. And Lord, for our country and our leaders of our country, we pray, Father, that in all we say and do, we'll bring glory to you. And we ask God that we'll turn back to you and that we'll be your people. Bless us now, Lord, as we worship. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
He is God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. He is Lord of all humanity, and he rules by his word. He is king of all the ages, the first and the last. I'm his child by mercy, forgiven from my sinful past. He is a dying savior, bruised, shamed, and despised. He is the great redeemer, Bringing victory in life He is the risen conqueror Setting my captive spirit free And I love him, yes I love him Because he first loved me When I see who he is I realize what I am and I wonder why a holy God would ever reach down so far and place me in his hand. My ears had heard the story, but now my eyes have seen his glory. And I can't turn away from his grace. I'm incredibly Miraculously saved He's my friend and gentle shepherd My shelter from the storm He is closer than a brother And the rock I lean upon He is my Abba Father my confidence, my love, I'm dependent on his goodness, lost but for his blood. When I see who he is, I realize what I am, and I wonder why a holy God would ever reach down so far. Place me in his hand My ears had heard the story But now my eyes have seen his glory And I can't turn away from his grace I'm incredibly, miraculously saved When I see who he And I wonder why a holy God would ever reach down so far and place me in his hand. My ears had heard the story, but now my eyes have seen his glory, and I can't turn away from his grace. I'm incredibly Miraculously saved I'm incredibly Miraculously Saved greatly appreciate that and we're so thankful for all of those who participate in our music ministry we love to hear our kids sing we thank are so thankful for our choir and we are just uh, so blessed we want to praise the lord and we want to encourage others to praise the lord i'm so glad to see uh, brother raymond and miss jean with us today they haven't been able to be with us for a while but i'm um, so thankful they're able to be with us if you don't bro know brother raymond and miss jean you need to get to know them they're special people and we praise the lord for them Take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Habakkuk in the Old Testament. 
I don't know that I've ever preached a message from the book of Habakkuk. And uh, recently, uh, my test was on these Old Testament prophets. And as I was studying this passage of Scripture, the Lord just spoke to my heart. And I thought, this applies well to what a lot of people are going through today. And so we're going to look at verses in chapter 1 of Habakkuk. There's only three chapters. We're going to look at some verses from all three chapters. And basically what happens in this book, this is a time of Israel's persecution. They're facing a lot of trials. They're under oppression from the Assyrians. They're under oppression from the Egyptians. And uh, Habakkuk sees a lot of evil in Israel as well. And so he is asking God questions. You know, Lord, why are you letting these things happen? How long are these things going to be? God gives him some answers, but it's probably not the answers that he was looking for. And sometimes that's the way it is in life, right? We ask God questions and we pray about things, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with having moments of questioning. The problem is when we are consumed by the doubts, discouragements, or the questions. We've got to find faith as Christians in the midst of our difficulties. We may have times of discouragement and doubt. We just can't stay there. We've got to realize that God is good and that He loves us. And that's what we're going to talk about today. I've entitled this message, Questions, Answers, and Conclusions. And I hope and pray that it will be a blessing to you. Let's pray together and then we'll read our scripture. Would you pray with me? Lord, I think about the song that the choir sang. And Lord, I know you're here. You have promised when two or three are gathered together, you're in the midst. And we have gathered together not for our own purposes, not for our own glory. We have gathered together to acknowledge how good you are and how much you deserve our praise. And Lord, there are times in our lives when things happen that are discouraging. There are times in our lives when things happen that we question why. But God, you're always there. And Father, today I pray that we would just feel your presence, and I pray that you will move in our midst. Lord, whatever heartaches may be here in our midst today, may you show us that you know the end of the story, and that one of these days we're going to be with you, and all of these things will be behind us. And Lord, sometimes we pray, and perhaps the answer does not come exactly the way we want it to, but you're still a good and gracious and loving God. So God, whatever we face, give us grace. Bless your people today. Lord, help me to say the words that you would have me to say, and help me not to say anything that you would not have me to say. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I'll give you a little bit of the background here. Habakkuk, again, is living in a time when Israel is being oppressed. They ha here in Judah, they, they, they have two kingdoms. The northern kingdom has already been taken over by the Assyrians. Here in Judah, they're being oppressed by the Assyrians, by the Egyptians. The Babylonians are coming to power. And he's going to cry out about everything he sees. Even in Israel, there's problems. So let's begin reading in verse number 1 and verse number 2. Then we're going to get, uh, skip down to verse number 5 and 6. And I'll, I'll guide you as we skip through these verses. Verses 1 and 2. The burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw. Isn't that an interesting title? The burden. I'm going to preach to you about a burden today. Verse 2. O Lord, how long shall I cry? And you will not hear, even cry out to you violence, and you will not save. Wow, what a powerful question. What a powerful prayer. Lord, I'm crying out to you, but it doesn't seem like you're listening, and it doesn't seem like you're doing anything about it. The Lord's reply in verse number 5 and 6. Look among the nations and watch be utterly astounded. For I will work a work in your days which you would not believe, though it were told you. For I indeed am raising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and hasty nation, which marches through the breadth of the earth to possess their dwelling places that are not theirs. Now we're going to go to verse number 12. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord, God, my Holy One, 
we shall not die. O Lord, you have appointed them for judgment. O rock, you have marked them for correction. You are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. Why do you look on those who deal treacherously and hold your tongue when the wicked devours a person more righteous than he? Now we'll go to chapter number 2 and read verse number 2. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for the appointed time. But at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it. Because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him. But the just shall live by faith. Now let's look at chapter number 3 and verse number 2. O Lord, I have heard your speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. Now chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food. Though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet. And he will make me walk on my high heels to the chief musician with my string instruments. Now, I know that Old Testament prophets like this and these books can be difficult to understand. My test the other night was on nine different books of, of the prophets. That's why I asked you to pray for me. Well, one reason I, I asked you to pray for me while I was taking that test. It was a complicated test, and all these things kind of run together as you study them. There is a, a story uh, from Augustine. And when he first became a Christian, uh, he was told by Ambrose, who was sort of his mentor, that he should read the book of Isaiah. And so he started reading the book of Isaiah, and he wrote in his notes, it's too complicated for me, and so he went and started studying the Psalms. Well, when you read a passage of Scripture like this, it might seem to be a little bit confusing, but I'm going to try to give you some practical applications from this passage of Scripture as we talk about questions and answers. If you could ask God... A direct question. Now, we can, we can ask God things in prayer, but I mean if you had a direct conversation with the Lord, like you're sitting down with a person, and you could ask him in that direct conversation anything you wanted to ask him, what would you ask? Well, some children gave their responses. Dear God, I went to this wedding and they kissed in church. Is that okay? Dear God, I think about you sometimes even when I'm not praying. Dear God, thank you for the baby brother, but what I really wanted was a puppy. Dear God, if you watch in church on Sunday, I can show you my new shoes. Dear God, if, I, if you give me a genie lamp like Aladdin, I'll give you anything you want except my money or my chest set. Dear God, please send Dennis Clark to a different camp next year. Dear God, maybe Cain and Abel would not kill each other if they had separate rooms that works for me and my brother. Dear God, please put another holiday between Christmas and Easter. There's nothing good in there now. And I think all we can relate to all of those things and hear those children th saying those things. There are times in all of our lives when we have some questions. Right? There are times in all of our lives when we just have some questions that we don't have answers to. And many times those questions come out of hardships or heartaches. We face a trial or a difficulty and we want to ask God why. And that's a natural human response. It is very difficult when we go through those times not to cry out like Habakkuk, Why, O oh Lord, I'm praying and you're not answering. And the Bible has much insight about facing these times. Habakkuk was a prophet of the Old Testament. He prophesied in the latter part of the 7th century B.C. This was a difficult time for Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel, and he has some questions for God. And the first question we found in the first verses, How long, O Lord? How long, O Lord? Do I have to cry forever, Lord? Now this passage of Scripture reminds me of Psalm chapter 13, when David, who's a man after God's own heart, cries out similarly. 
This is what David said in Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my own soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Have you ever felt like that? Now David, at the end of Psalm 13, in just a few verses, he came to the conclusion that God is good and that he can trust in the Lord. And Habakkuk comes to the same conclusion. But there are moments when it's hard to see through eyes of faith. The nation of Judah had endured tremendous persecutions. The Assyrians, a wicked and brutal people, had overrun the northern kingdom of Israel over a hundred years before Habakkuk. Now Assyria combined with Egypt was oppressing Judah. Josiah, a good king for Judah, had been killed in battle with the Egyptians. Judah's king Jehoiakim, the second son of Josiah, was appointed by an Egyptian pharaoh. So to simplify Habakkuk's complaint, Judah was under control of other nations. The Israelites are God's people. They have God's temple. Yet all these bad things are happening. It was a difficult time. Judah was facing trials. How could God allow these evil people to rule his righteous people? Well, as we study the prophets, we find that Israel and Judah were overrun because of their wickedness, social injustice, and idolatry. When you read the prophets, they're constantly saying, you're involved in idolatry. You're mistreating the poor. You're not taking care of your own people that need to be taken care of. You're stealing people's lands. And the prophets pointed out all the wrong things that they were doing. And as a result, they're going to be overrun. But Habakkuk is struggling with what is going on. And he asks God these questions. He's crying. He's crying out to the Lord. He's lamenting to the Lord. He's pouring out his soul to the Lord. Have you ever been in a situation where you did not understand what was going on? I think all of us have been in those situations. I get calls almost every week where somebody calls me and shares a prayer request with me. And I wonder why, Lord, or what's going on? And again, I don't think it's wrong to feel that way. I think it's wrong to stay in that mentality. Even some of God's most faithful servants face times like this. Stephen Curtis Chapman is one of the best-known singer-songwriters of contemporary Christian music. Over the last 15 or 20 years, his songs have blessed millions of people. In 2008, tragedy struck the Chapman home, and Michelle Malkin wrote about it. This is what she said. Stephen Curtis Chapman's five-year-old adopted daughter, Maria Sue, died Wednesday when her teenage brother accidentally ran over her as he backed the family's car out of the driveway. Chapman's music and life have been inspired by and centered on family and faith. His oldest daughter encouraged Chapman and his wife to adopt after having three of their own natural-born children. The couple adopted three beautiful girls from China. They performed missionary work in Chinese orphanages and established a charity named after their first adopted daughter. Shinona, at the time the accident occurred, the family was celebrating the engagement of the oldest daughter, Emily Chapman, and were just four hours away from the graduation party of their son, Caleb, as he completed high school. Now they are preparing to bury a child who blew out five candles on a birthday cake less than ten days ago. Now this happened in 2008. We wonder why, but that's okay. The Bible itself raises this question. It never backs away from it. The, promise, the problem of suffering and evil is in Habakkuk, Jeremiah, Job, and many of the Psalms. God does not condemn people for asking such questions. For instance, Jeremiah 12, 1 says, Righteous are you, O Lord, when I plead with you, yet let me talk with you about your judgments. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why are those happy who deal so treacherously? Psalms ask the same. Why, O Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Why are the heavens silent when I ask for help? Why do, you go, why do the good suffer? Why do the evil prosper? Anyone who tries to gloss over or minimize the problem of evil doesn't get it. It's all throughout the Bible. Now, that's a difficult story to read. I mean, here's a man working for the Lord, involved with missions. He's doing all of these right things, and he loses this adopted daughter. And to make things more complicated, it happened by the hand of his son. And so this is just a, a heartbreaking situation and a heartbreaking story. How do we respond to these things? Sometimes we cry out, why, O Lord, 
but God always gives an answer. And God is going to answer Habakkuk, but it's not going to be in the way Habakkuk wants. It's going to be a strange answer. Habakkuk is crying out and he's saying, the Assyrians are coming. The Egyptians are ruling over us. All of these bad things are happening from within. Lord, what are you going to do about it? In verses 5 and 6, God answers and he says, I'm raising up the Chaldeans. Now, this is a strange response. The Chaldeans were the Babylonians. They're kind of the pre-Babylonians, the ones before they became the official Babylonians. And he's basically saying, you don't have to worry about the Assyrians. You don't have to worry about the Egyptians. I'm raising up the Babylonians, and they're going to completely wipe you out. And that's the answer that he gets. He's praying, why, O oh Lord, are these things happening? Now, for illustration, let's say that China was in control of America. We were not destroyed, but we had to send money to China, and our president was basically under the control of China. Now, why are some of y'all looking at me that way? I don't understand why y'all looking at me that way. And so we fast and pray to God and plead with God about our desperate situation. God speaks to us, and he says, I hear you, and I'm raising up the Russians to destroy the Chinese. Now, wouldn't that be good news? No. That wouldn't be good news. That's out of the frying pan into the fire. And so here in this historical record, Habakkuk the prophet is praying, Lord, deliver us from all these bad things that are happening. And God says, I'm raising up the Chaldeans and they're going to come and wipe you out. I mean, this is a hard answer from God. It reminds me of what Isaiah says in Isaiah 55, 8 through 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. You know, this just reminds me that there are things in life that I'm just not going to understand. And I will not understand until I get to heaven and the Lord lifts that cloud and I'm able to see face to face. But today, my response needs to be a response of faith. My response is to trust the Lord even when I do not understand. And so I have to conclude there are things I will not understand until I get to heaven, but I can trust God and I can trust His goodness and I can trust His love even in the midst of the difficulties. Now the second question that he poses in chapter 1 is in verses 12 through 13. He receives this word that God is raising up the Chaldeans and they're going to be wiped away and basically says, God, you're a good God. Why would you allow the wicked to overtake the righteous? Why the wicked? That's the question. Why will you allow the wicked to destroy us? Lord, you're going to allow the wicked Babylonians to destroy us? No, Lord, you're righteous. You take care of your people. You would never do that. Lord, certainly we are more righteous than the Babylonians. How can this be? I read these verses and I think, man, I feel bad for Habakkuk. I feel, feel bad for what's going on. He's preaching in a time when there's nothing but heartache and discouragement. But God answers Habakkuk's second question, and he says, wait for it. He says, I'm going to accomplish my purposes at an appointed time. It is hard to wait. You know, I don't have a lot of patience. I don't have a lot of patience when I'm in a drive through line. I don't have a lot of patience when I'm sitting in a restaurant. I don't have a lot of patience when I'm in line at the grocery store. You know, every time I get in line at the grocery store, there's someone that's got 300 coupons, and they're writing a check, and they're doing everything to slow down the process. And then they want to talk about their cousin's friend or whatever, and they just are slowing down everything. I'm like, get out of the line, go talk somewhere else. Let me get through this line, you know. I don't have a lot of patience. But sometimes God tells us to wait. God tells us, you're just going to have to trust me and I'm going to accomplish my purposes at the appointed time. Think about the Old Testament prophets. When you get from Malachi to John the Baptist, there's 400 years where the children of Israel didn't hear anything from the Lord. Nobody's saying anything. And there must have been times when they thought, How long, O Lord? Why are we going through this? Now we're under the Romans. We've been through the Greeks. We've been through the Romans. Now we're under the Romans and, and they're taking over us. We've been through all this persecution. And God says, wait. And at the appointed time, I will answer. Warren Wearsby said, the ability to calm your soul and wait before God is one of the most difficult things in the Christian life. I agree. Our old nature is restless. The world around us is frantically in a hurry. 
But a restless heart usually leads to a reckless life. And I believe that's true. You know, we have to wait. We have to wait on the Lord. God is going to show up at the right time. God is going to show up at the perfect time. God is going to bring about His plan and His purpose and His peace at the perfect time. And we just have to wait. Last week we talked about going to heaven and God wiping away all the tears from our eyes. God will accomplish His purpose at His perfect time. I read this story. A family was out vacationing at the lake one summer. Dad had put puttering Uh, Dad had been puttering out by the boathouse. Two of his sons, 12-year-old and 3-year-old, were down playing along the dock. The 12-year-old was supposed to be watching his little brother, but he got distracted. And the 3-year-old, little Billy, thought that uh, it would be a good time to check out the shiny aluminum fishing boat tied up at the end of the dock. So he went to the dock and put one foot on the boat and one foot on the dock. He lost his balance, fell into the water, which was about 5 or 6 foot deep. The splash altered the 12-year-old who let out a piercing scream. Panic, he went right back down into the murky water and began to feel everywhere around the bottom. He couldn't feel anything. Finally, on his way up, he felt little Billy's arms locked in a death grip on the post of the dock, four feet underwater. Prying the boy's fingers loose, they burst up together through the surface to fill their lungs with life-giving air. Finally, when the adrenaline had stopped surging and nerves had calmed down a little bit, the father asked his son, What on earth were you doing down there hanging on to the post so far under the water? And little Billy's answer was classic, laced with wisdom from a toddler. He said, I was just waiting. I like it. We see a lot of things going on in our world, and it's hard to wait. It's hard to have patience. It's hard to say, Lord, I'm going to trust you in this storm. I'm going to trust you in all the difficulties that I'm facing. But God says, wait for it. I will accomplish my purposes at the appointed time. Isaiah 40 and verse 31 says, But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. It's hard to wait. Many of you know the story of my oldest son, Blake, and how that yesterday he was released from 63 months of prison. My son was a youth minister at a church in Aden, and he got involved in alcohol. He was the kind of boy growing up just like these kids up here that sang the songs and remembered the scripture, and, and he would go to Bojangles and stand up in front of the ladies at Bojangles, and he would quote scripture at three years old. He just was a model young man, and he got involved in alcohol. And the next thing I know, he, we had a big problem. And we tried to get him help. And I remember going to my niece's wedding, and I thought he was fine. He had gone through some processes to get help. And I remember at that wedding, there was some alcohol. He didn't drink anything. And I looked at Lisa, and I said, we don't have to worry about Blake anymore. He's going to be fine. The next Tuesday, he had a head-on collision, and it was his fault. And it was, a, it was a horrifying situation. And waiting for him to get out for over five years was hard. And I used to go and see him every week in the prison, in the different places where he was. And it was hard. And I'm going to tell you, it's hard to wait. When you're praying, Lord, let him come out early. Lord, change the circumstances. Lord, I know this is a terrible thing that has happened, but I know his heart, he he doesn't belong there. and We're worried about where he's sleeping and what's going on, but God was with him every step of the way. And I know it is hard to wait, but I can tell you, yesterday, there were things coming out of me I had never felt before. I didn't even know those things were inside. All these feelings, all these emotions. He walked through that fence And we just had a glorious reunion. And it made me think about one of these days when we get to heaven and we're all reunited together and we're with the Lord and we don't have to worry about those things anymore and all these things are behind us. And then as we were were leaving the prison, we drove from where we were. There were some friends that said, Blake, we love you. We'll miss you, Blake. Take care of yourself, Blake. And when we ran around the corner and we were starting to leave, there were more of his friends that were singing This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it as we went down the the road to go out. We love you, Blake. We appreciate you, Blake. And Blake's preaching in Greenville today, and that's where Lisa is. But you know what? It's hard to wait. 
You know, sometimes I, I don't have patience and God is telling me to wait. It's hard to have faith in a time like that. But God says, I will accomplish my purposes at my appointed time. I will bring about my purposes. You're just going to have to trust me. And that's one of the conclusions that we find here. He says, Lord, you're going to allow the wicked to overtake us. And he says, you're going to have to wait for it and it will be an appointed time. But the conclusion, the first conclusion that Habakkuk comes to is that the just will live by faith. And Paul says that over and over again in the New Testament. Faith is believing when you do not understand. That's what faith is. Think about the disciples. They've been following the Lord Jesus. They've been listening to all of His words, His powerful testimonies. They've seen His miraculous works. And all of a sudden, He's been arrested. Do you think their faith was tested? Absolutely. They did not know what was going on. But God was accomplishing the greatest victory in all of human history, through the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. We must live by faith. Faith is trusting when you cannot see any purpose. God, I don't understand. God, I cannot see a purpose in these circumstances. You know, many times in hindsight, you can look back over events and you can see God's hand and how He worked. But you know, looking forward to my son going to prison for over five years, it's hard for me to see a purpose. But when we came out of it and we looked back and I heard those men singing those songs and I thought about the different influences that he had had in prison, I could see through hindsight how God had worked. It was hard. It was painful. But God had worked and we just must trust the Lord in the good times and we must trust the Lord in the bad, time, bad times. Now some of you have gone through much harder days than I've gone through. But when I face heartaches as a Christian... And I want to question like Habakkuk and say, How long, O oh Lord, and how can you let the righteous suffer like many of the Psalms have done? I always look to the cross. I always look to the cross of Jesus Christ. Draw me nearer to thy precious bleeding side. If God loved me so much that he gave his only begotten son, I know he loves me. And whatever you're going through today, I want you to know God loves you. And you may feel like that your circumstances are so heavy that you cannot find peace, you cannot find joy. God loves you. He has demonstrated His love for you. And at the appointed time, you will understand. Just wait and trust in the Lord, even if it's hard. The just live by faith. Lord, I don't understand, but I trust you. We can rest in His care, and we can find joy and peace even in the midst of the hardships. Habakkuk had prayed. God said, I will destroy you with someone else, and you're just going to have to wait for it. These are strange responses. I don't know if it hits you strange, but it hits me very strange. But he concluded that the just shall live by faith, and Paul places much emphasis in the just living by faith. The second conclusion that Habakkuk comes to is that I will rejoice in God. He comes to the end of this passage and he just gives us some beautiful, beautiful words here. He says, Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food. I've got a study page in between my scripture here. Though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will joy in the God of my salvation. Basically, Habakkuk comes to the conclusion and says, if I have no food, if all of my work goes down the drain, if there's nothing good in my life, I will rejoice in the Lord. And that's what David did in Psalm 13. He says, if I work and work in the fields and nothing comes from it, I still will rejoice in the Lord. He says, the just will live by faith and I will rejoice in the Lord. These are the conclusions that we must come to if we're going to see God's purposes in our lives. Habakkuk ends his book by concluding that whatever happens in his life and in the life of Judah, that he would praise the Lord. I will praise you in this storm, Lord. I will praise you in the midst of this difficulty. I don't understand, but I will praise you. It is not easy to wait. It is difficult when we don't understand. Sometimes it's difficult to trust and praise, but it makes all the difference to praise the Lord even in the midst of the difficulties because even if it does not change the circumstances, praising the Lord always changes our hearts. 
Coming to God in the midst of prayer and saying, Lord, I don't understand. Lord, I've got questions, but I trust You and I know You're a good and gracious God. It allows us to process what we're going through and it allows us to feel His presence in a way that it changes our heart. Grief and heartache is a process. That's one thing that I've learned through our Grief Share classes. Grief and heartache is a process and it's different for every person. You have one person that's lost a loved one, they've got to grieve a certain way. Another person's lost a loved one, different circumstances, they've got to grieve a certain way. But every step of the way and every step of the process, God is with us. We sang this morning, He is here. I believe God is here. I believe He's ministering in our hearts and in our lives. He is our strength. We can trust in Him. We can rejoice in Him. This week during one of my classes, we were taking prayer requests. And this one lady said, my, my daughter is a college student at North Carolina State University. She said, please be praying for these students. Since the first of the year, nine students have taken their lives. At NC State, since the first of the year. What's going on in our world today? This isn't, you know, we see these things everywhere, but it's happening right here. We've got so many young people that are growing up today feeling like I'll never measure up. I'm never going to be good enough. I'm never going to be smart enough. I'm never going to be thin enough. I'm never going to be the right shape or pretty enough. And it's sad that our whole society has put these pressures on people instead of allowing them to know that God has made them fearfully and wonderfully and they're precious to Almighty God. That's what we need to continue to emphasize to our children today. They're important to God and God loves them. We need God in our lives. He is absolutely necessary for completeness, completeness in life. There's a hole in all of us that only the Lord can fill. And if you will come to Him with your emptiness, He will fill you with His joy. Come to Him with your heartache and He will fill you with His peace. Come to Him with your cares and cast all your cares upon Him because He cares for you. I don't know what you're going through, but I tell you today, if you're burdened today, bring your burdens to the Lord and He will receive them and you can leave them there and He can give you peace. It doesn't mean that all the circumstances are going to change. Sometimes we have to wait for it. Sometimes we have to say, Lord, I trust Your appointed time to accomplish Your purposes. But I believe our God is a God of grace. I believe our God is a God of mercy. I believe our God is a God of forgiveness. And you can find what you're longing for in the Lord. Trust Him. Put your faith in Him. Receive His love and forgiveness. Trust Him in the good times and the bad times. And one day we'll be with the Lord and all of this will be behind us. But even here and now, we can rejoice and experience a more abundant life that is only available in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And just know this. Whatever you're going through, God cares. And whatever you're going through, we care. You may feel like today I'm going through something and I don't have a friend in the world. We care. We genuinely care about our people. We genuinely love our people. We genuinely love our children. We want to help our people. We want to help you in your relationship with the Lord as you grow in your faith. You know, it's not easy when you're going through these times. Many of us like Habakkuk say, How long, O Lord? And how can you let the wicked prosper? And God says, You're going to have to trust me. You're going to have to wait for it. And one of these days we'll see face to face and all of these things will be behind us. The just shall live by faith and we can rejoice in the Lord in the good times and in the bad. Would you pray with me today? Lord, I thank you for your holy word. And I know, Lord, that this is an unusual passage of scripture to preach on because the Old Testament prophets can be kind of confusing. But God, we find some tremendous truth here. We can live by faith. We can trust you in the good times and the bad. We can rejoice when we have a big crop and we can rejoice when all the crop fails because we have Jesus as our Savior and our Lord. And we have the hope of eternal life and we're so encouraged by that today, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that we will find your joy and peace even in the midst of the difficulties. We can find joy today because we're saved. Because we're saved, Lord, we're forgiven by your grace. God, may we seek your joy and find it today. With heads bowed and eyes closed, nobody's looking around. Perhaps you're hearing God is speaking to your heart. I don't want to embarrass you. I just want to pray for you.
Would you lift up your hand and say, Preacher, pray for me. I've got a special need. God bless you. 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 Lord, you see the hands, and more importantly, you see the hearts. Bless us in our time of invitation. And Lord, whatever the needs may be this morning, may they come and may they pray. May they pour out their hearts to you, knowing that they will receive from you your grace and peace and joy today. Hear our concerns, Lord. Hear our prayers, Lord. We know you're good. We know you love us. But hear our hearts today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and we're going to sing, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. And as God speaks to your heart, would you come? Thank you so much for your faithfulness this morning. Don't forget about our love offering for earthquake victims this morning. If you would like to give, we encourage you to give as the Lord would challenge your heart. Let's pray together. Father, we commit this time into your hands, and we ask, Lord, that as we go to our separate places, that you'll keep us safe on the roads and bring us back to the next appointed time. And, God, we just pray for the heartaches that are in our church and in our church family. And, Lord, some things have happened a long time ago, but they're still on our hearts and on our minds. And God, I just pray you'll give us peace. I pray that you can make things better. Lord, some of the things that we face, they never go away, but we know, Lord, you can make things better through your grace, through your mercy, through your love. So, Lord, minister to your people. Thank you, Lord, for each and every person that is here today. I pray, Father, that you will just uh, bless us and help us to be a witness. Help our light to shine. Our children sing about their light shining. Help our light to shine so people are drawn to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.